there's a lot of exciting talk of missions that go beyond the moon and Mars. So it's really very exciting times for the Chinese space industry. It's becoming a more familiar sight. Chinese rockets, astronauts and rovers are making more regular appearances on our screens. China was a late entrant to space, bursting onto the scene at the start of the 21st century as the third country to independently send humans into space. But it's the speed of the development of the Chinese space program that's adding interest and impetus to a new era of space exploration. China is definitely moving ahead. China has a very ambitious space program. It, it's taken a very long and clear look at what it wants to do. Uh, and in many areas, it is moving forward. Private companies and countries new to aerospace are creating history alongside the big players. Morgan Stanley estimated the global space industry's revenue will be worth $1 trillion by 2040. The re-energized China National Space Administration, or CNSA, is also setting itself a fast pace, backed by a strong economy and manufacturing sector. It's running parallel programs on Mars, the Moon, and now building their first multi-module space station, Tianguang, or Heavenly Palace. This is what the completed space station will look like. But so far, only the 22.5-tonne core module has been deployed. Shenzhou 12 astronauts have docked with the module to start developing the station. Liu Boming and Kong Hongbo climbed into their spacesuits with the portable life support system, which also serves as a rear entry hatch, a new innovation, before setting out on a tandem spacewalk on the module, another first for the CNSA. They're the first Chinese astronauts since 2008 to go outside their spacecraft. China's first person in space, Yang Li Wei, is currently the deputy chief designer of China's manned space mission. The astronauts' main task was to attach a 10-meter robotic arm to help install other tools. This mission is scheduled to last three months, and later the station will be expanded with the addition of two laboratory modules, which will launch next year. Professor Chris Welsh from the International Space University thinks there are many reasons for China's ambitious program. Globally, people will tend to follow those who are successful, whether it's the US or private enterprise or China or India or, or, or somebody else. Space exploration is a diplomatic tool as well as a scientific and human endeavour for China, because by doing all the things that it's done and doing them so successfully, it, it's marking itself out as a, as a global player. And I think the other thing that, that China brings is a sort of long-term and consistent vision. For instance, you know, the European Space Agency, uh, you know, wonderful organisation, but it has, you know, 27, I think, member states at the moment, and so making decisions is inevitably more complicated. The NASA administrator is a political appointee of the president, and so every time that there is a change in administration, you know, nobody knows quite what is going to happen to NASA's plans. I think one of China's strengths is it has a plan. It's a very well thought out plan. Um, it, it's a very broad plan. All the pieces lock together. The CNSA has little choice but to go it alone because of the US ban on Chinese astronauts on the International Space Station, which is set to stop operating in 2024, but may yet extend its operations. Xu Yangsong worked for CNSA for nearly 30 years and would like to see politics put to one side. 
the scientific communities needs to work together with more space programs coming up from China. Uh, these efforts are needed and essential for not just bilateral cooperation, but for life support and rescue support. China has over a hundred space-related bilateral agreements with countries including European and South American nations that cover many aspects of space exploration and satellites. The Moon is the main focus, but sending an orbiter and rover to Mars was a true test considering it was a solo effort and the first attempt to travel to the Red Planet. Were there any nervous moments during the landing or did it all work very well? It happened on the, our time, it's the second half uh, of midnight. So everybody was sleeping and it was landed on, at seven o'clock in the morning. So we wake up with good news. Now the Shurong rover is sending back images from where it landed on Mars in Utopia Planitia. So what does this achievement mean for China's space program? Well, it's the most remote uh, space body we have touched down on uh, and it's uh, most exciting uh, to the space community in China as well as the technical uh, community and scientists so that we, we're uh, beyond the moon we can do something else. So uh, everybody is more excited and because there's no calibration and uh, ground facilities on Mars surface, we'll be using the real data from the rover and lander itself in calibration with the orbiter so we can have a global image of water deposit on Mars. The information that you're gathering on Mars, will China be sharing that with the scientific community? Most definitely. We are using these Chinese Academy of Sciences and other neutral bodies to, depart, to distribute these uh, uh, data uh, in addition to CNSA who has collecting all this data and put them together. This is similar to the uh, lunar sample return missions. NASA's Ingenuity helicopter has been thrilling earthly audiences with its flights, the first on another planet. And China is keen to put its enormous manufacturing industry to work on its own robots. We had the same idea of putting a hopping uh, robotic mobile station on the surface of the moon so that we can not only just uh, using the rover to cover the distance but we hover on the surface of the moon to study more uh, more areas, more distance. China's enthusiasm for space is growing as fast as its space economy. State-owned industry giants CASC and CASIC each generate an estimated revenue of over $35 billion. There's also an increasing number of private sector investors after the Chinese government opened up the space sector in 2014. Jean Deville has a background in aerospace engineering and blogs about the Chinese space program. He says the government has really made an effort to get the public involved. The achievements are a source of great pride for all. Over the past few years, we've had an event called China Space Day, which takes place on the 24th of April every year. That's the anniversary of the first launch of China's first satellite, Dongfang Hong, in 1970. Every year it's in a different city in China. And so there are lots of events that day and schools and artists take part. They like to do naming competitions for some of their spacecraft and this has attracted a lot of interest from the Chinese population. We have a lot of discussion on space, on you know Chinese platforms such as Weibo, we have internet forums, we have WeChat groups. The Chinese space industry is maybe slightly more closed in terms of how it communicates and how it reveals information. Uh, NASA basically just publishes everything it's working on. It live streams its launches. The, I mean, it's really amazing how open NASA is to its program. The Chinese, on the other hand, especially the state-owned players, are a bit more, less willing to reveal information. China's ambition and ongoing success in space has many admirers. Mars is a solo mission, but China will be partnering with the European Space Agency to secure a sample return. But Jean says it's unlikely the relationship between China and the US will soften anytime soon. 
It's literally rock bottom. NASA is not allowed to collaborate directly with China um, unless there's an approval from Congress. Um, and that's that's gone on for, for many years now. There have been some very specific ones that have been authorized, but it's, it's very limited. And this may change on the medium long term because um, for multiple reasons, there are some in the US, for example, who say, well, excluding China from all these um, space collaborations where the U.S. is present, it's not a it's not a good way and an efficient way to move forward because uh, China just does those missions on itself anyway. And you can see that, uh, for example, with the Chinese um, space station in low Earth orbit and, and you know their lunar missions and other Mars missions, they don't need the U.S. to move forward with these missions. So that's the first point. And I think at some point also, um, certain very ambitious space exploration programs are so costly that it's, it, I think it's almost unavoidable if there's no cooperation between the, these two superpowers. And especially when we're going to start talking about if that ever happens sometime in the future, um, crewed programs to um, say um, a place as far as Mars, I, I, it's very hard to see how uh, these two countries and just all, all countries in general would not collaborate when it's such a, an ambitious and costly program. The Chinese space program has shown it can go it alone and succeed. But recently it announced a partnership with Russia to build the Joint International Lunar Research Station, or ILRS, scheduled to be ready for crewed visits by 2036. China is also open to collaborating with other countries on the project. Reconnaissance is taking place now, then possible sites will be chosen before construction begins. Combining the Russian Luna 26, 27, and beyond uh, with the Chinese uh, China 6 or China 7 and polar missions. So uh, we will have a number of missions, like four or five uh, missions to, to the moon before we start the construction of what we call scientific base. Uh, the scientific base is similar to the European Space Agency proposal of a lunar village or like the international community that we can have a collective effort to study the moon in a, in a designated area where you have more interested uh, scientific focus. Of course, uh, studying the deposits uh, for resource is, is one reason, but it's not related to uh, something like space mining, because those are still in a disputed areas in terms of legal perspective. Now, we are uh, doing the situ studies with the international community so that we are uh, working together with the same goal. Uh, and that could be in preparation for more deeper space exploration and human missions. But Chinese human missions to the moon could be at least 10 years away because it needs bigger launch vehicles. Currently, the biggest rocket China has is a Long March 5. A Long March 9 is under development, which is 10 meters in diameter and around 100 meters long. What would the Long March 9 rocket be fueled by? It's a combination of liquid kerosene, like the oxygen uh, rocket uh, engines. So each engine would have more than 400 uh, tons of thrust. And they also have a combination with the uh, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen as an upper stage, because the, uh, the ratio of propulsion, once you, you are out of atmosphere, uh, is, is much efficient. Structure-wise, also we have many groundbreaking structures, like you have to forge parts, a ring of 10 meter diameter ring, and also building a new launch site uh, to accommodate, to cope with the diameters and the size of the rocket. So it, it will take some time, uh, but uh, we are doing that effort. You said 400 tons of thrust per engine. How many engines are we talking about here? Uh, that will depend on the configuration of the rocket itself. I would imagine eight engines plus the core, core stage. The core stage could be four, uh, four plus engines. So it's like a blow up version of Lamar Tribe. <laughs> wow, massive. <laughs> it will take around 10 years to transport cargo and equipment to the lunar surface via uncrewed ships. Finally, in 2036, human visitors will arrive to begin scientific work and further building of the base. Such a complex program will require sustained amounts of investment, and China seems determined to do what it takes to succeed. Exactly how much China spends on space 
is not very clear, frankly, to, 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 the, to the outside world because figures don't get released in the same sort of way that they would for the European Space Agency or for NASA or anything like that. According to estimates I've seen, it's maybe about 60% of the amount that, that NASA is spending. And so that allows for a very significant space program. And the plans extend deep into Earth's solar system. And what's exciting is that China is planning missions that go beyond Mars. Probes that would go visit Jupiter and some of the Jovian moons, I think notably of Callisto. There's discussion also of a flyby of Uranus, uh, of also a sample return on an asteroid. So there's a lot of exciting talk of missions that go beyond the moon and Mars. So it's really very exciting times for the Chinese space industry. And we can add diverting asteroids to that long list. Chinese scientists are planning to fire 23 Long March 5 rockets at the Bennu asteroid, which has a 1 in 2,700 chance of hitting Earth between the years of 2,175 and 2,199. Others are also working on a nudging method. China's space program seems destined to keep reaching higher and further into our solar system. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and hit the bell button below for notifications. We'll see you next time.